draft month is finally here and we are starting april off with a mock draft with the bears on the clock i don't think there is a lot of analysis to be had i don't think there's a lot of input that's needed we can go ahead and skip the pick two as caleb williams will be the number one overall pick in the 2024 draft now with washington on the clock i think this boils down to two players I, there's been rumors recently about jj mccarthy potentially being the number two overall pick i personally don't buy that and i think this comes down to drake may and Jaden daniels and ultimately i think washington will lean with daniels because there's a lot of concern with may's footwork and with may's lack of consistency and I think that's scary. I think it's going to scare a lot of NFL teams. You know, I've seen JT O'Sullivan comment quite a bit about Drake May's, you know, lack of consistency where if you miss only three or four throws a game, that adds up quick. And NFL teams don't want to deal with a guy, at least with the number two overall pick, when you can draft another quality player in Jaden Daniels and not have to deal with a guy missing five or six throws a game because of footwork. Now, that's not to say that Drake May is a future buster, that I think he's going to be a bad football player, because ultimately, I think it's a matter of fixing a couple of things. But when you have a dual threat like Jaden Daniels, fall right into your lap at pick two i think that's going to be a guy that washington's going to like a lot and obviously with all of the draft capital washington has in the top 100 they can address the offensive line they can even move up back into the first round if they would like and uh, i don't think Jaden daniels would be doomed from the start going from neighbors and uh, brian thomas jr to the commander supporting cast now with the patriots at pick three here uh i think they they will be looking to trade out of this pick uh the patriots are not a a great football team right now offensively I think I like where they are defensively but I think the Vikings are going to come up and I do think they they will select Drake May there's a lot of connections there uh Drake May was the or excuse me Josh McCown was Drake May's offensive or excuse me quarterback coach back in high school and that's a, a big connection and I don't think the Vikings hired McCown by accident I think that Drake May has been a guy that the Vikings have been looking at for not just the past month or two but I think that's a, a player that the Vikings have been looking at for well over a year now, with the Cardinals on the clock, I think there are a lot of trade back spots here. I think the Giants at six would be a big trade back candidate. But when you have a guy in Marvin Harrison Jr. fall into your lap, I don't think the Cardinals should overthink this. I'm a big advocate for take the blue chip talent if it's there. Marvin Harrison Jr. is there. And not only that, but I don't think they should risk you know, making Kyler Murray mad in the process. They have Marvin Harrison Jr. And I don't think you can go to Kyler and say, hey, hey, we have another 2025 first round pick because we've missed out on Marv. So good luck, buddy. Uh, you know, best of luck this year without one of the best receivers, the receiving prospects in the past 15 to 20 years. Good luck. Take Marvin Harrison Jr. Don't overthink it. Now with the Chargers on the clock, again, I am a advocate for taking blue chip talent if it's there. Malik Neighbors to me is most definitely a blue chip talent. And I think Neighbors is a top five receiving prospect in the past 15 years. Uh, I think he would be really behind only Marvin Harrison Jr. and Jamar Chase. Uh, if you want to have Jamar over Marvin. That's completely your choice. I didn't mean to word it like that. But anyways, Neighbors, elite receiving prospect. They need a lot of help in the receiving room. I don't want to say Quentin Johnson is destined for failure, but there's it's not every day that a Malik neighbors falls into your lap at pick five especially after you released Mike Williams and traded Keenan Allen now with the Giants at pick six I don't think Daniel Jones is going to be the long-term answer for them it would be nice if he was considering they signed him to a big long-term extension and everything but the problem with the Giants or at least one of the problems with the Giants is in Daniel Jones' career, which obviously dates back to 2019, the leading receiver in four of the five seasons that Jones has been the Giants' starting quarterback, or at least on the roster, has been Darius Slayton. And I like Darius Slayton's skill set a lot. I think he brings a lot to the table. But Darius Slayton has never had a 1,000 yards in a year, and Darius Slayton is not a number one receiver. And the only year that Darius Slayton did not lead the team in receiving yards was in 2021 when prized free agent signing Kenny Galladay led the team in receiving yards. So what I think the Giants should do here is take the best receiver available, and that would also be the best receiver since Odell Beckham was on the team, you know, almost a decade ago. Well, 2017, 2018, I mean, we're, we're going on over half a decade without Odell on the team. Look, get a number one receiver. Don't overthink it. Romo Dunze will help out a 
Daniel Jones will help out a, a guy that would succeed Daniel Jones at the quarterback position. He's a big, friendly target, and he is a very, very good receiver. Now, with the Titans on the clock here, we're actually going to trade back. And this is this might be surprising, so at least hear me out for a second. And the reason we're going to trade back is I think there is a very real possibility that Rand Carthon, the Titans GM on draft night, calls Terry Fontenot, the Falcons GM, and says, look, Terry, here's the deal. Ryan Poles is calling me at pick nine. Obviously, pick eight and nine are each going to want a pass rusher. So what we're going to do here is we are going to trade back with the Falcons a single spot. We're going to get pick 79, which is a third rounder. And we're also going to give them 182. We're going to go ahead and push this trade through. The Falcons are going to come up and get Dallas Turner, which I think makes a lot of sense for them. The Falcons have not had a pass rush in really several years. And I think the secondary that the Falcons have has, you know, it's been kind of exploited by a lack of by a lack of pass rush so we're going to get who i think is the best pass rusher in the draft in dallas turner and now with the titans on the clock really good really good drafting here by Rand carthon they do not have a third round pick this year because of the will levish trade up last year so we get an additional top 100 pick and we are going to take joe alt if, if the Titans can walk out of the first round with that while acquiring an additional three, I would absolutely love that, and I would crown them as pretty big winners from day one. Now, with the Bears on the clock at pick nine, I don't think there is a huge pass rush need in the next couple of picks. So what we're going to do here is we are going to trade with the Denver Broncos. We're going to we're going to get pick three here, or we're going to get we're going to get a third round pick for this. I think this is just going to be a, a pretty simple, just straight up trade, and we are going to give Sean Payton his quarterback of the future in JJ McCarthy. Uh, it's a pretty simple trade. The Bears also need some help, or not need some help, rather they need an additional top 100 pick. It would be very ideal for them uh, because they traded their second round pick last year for Montez Sweat. Love that trade, by the way. But uh, now with the Jets on the clock at pick 10. Oh, by the way, to go with the JJ pick. Look, Sean gets his quarterback of the future. I don't think it's a hot take to say that Jarrett Stidham is not going to be the future of the Denver Broncos, and I think it's going to be a, a long rebuild for the Broncos. You know, this is not going to be an overnight fix, and uh, it's. Gonna it's going to be a couple of years. So there's no rush to put JJ in right away, especially with the current supporting cast that the Broncos have. Now, with the Jets on the clock here, this is a player that I think has been entirely overthought. I think this is a guy that will be a very good left tackle for a very long time. He is just 21 years old. He had one bad game in two years which was against ohio state it was unfortunate that it was against ohio state and that jt tui Malowau got him a couple times that jack sawyer got him a couple times but guys we're talking about olu fashanu and a guy that had one bad game in two years and this is i mean guys at the nfl level players get beat all the time players give up sacks I don't want to say all the time, but even the best give up sacks. Even the best give up pressures. I'm not worried about one game from Olu Fashane when we have two years of body, two years of example of work to show that he's a great player. And not only that, but here's another reason why I like this pick to the Jets a lot. They signed Tyron Smith this offseason. They traded for Morgan Moses. I would be surprised if both tackles play all 17 games, especially Tyron given his injury history, but Olu is just 21 years old. So if Olu can sit back at least through training camp and learn from Tyron Smith, who by the way is only signed to a one-year deal, I think this is about as good of a developmental situation as you can possibly have. And there's a real possibility that three of your five offensive linemen moving forward, assuming they can stay healthy, of course, would be Olu Fashanu, Elijah Vera Tucker, and Joe Tipman. So love that for the Jets. And I think it's a good stash and develop. And even if Olu has to play in his rookie year, I think he'll be just fine. Now with the trade back for New England, they have Jacoby Brissett as their starting quarterback this year, or at least as of now they do because we haven't taken a quarterback for them yet. What we're going to do here, what we're going to try to do is we are going to simply take one of the best players at his position over the past few years and that's Brock Bowers. The Patriots are in a situation where their offense was truly anemic last year and they need to acquire better football players. So you trade back from pick three, you get three first round picks, 
They'll be on the clock again shortly. And you get a 2025 first next year, and you have one of the best tight end receiving prospects over the past few years who, I don't want to get into stat projections, but Brock will, I mean, I would be surprised if Brock's not a great NFL tight end. Now, with the Bears on the clock here, guys, I think this is good drafting. I think this is good value by Ryan Poles. You get picked 76 from the Broncos. You now have four top 100 picks. And uh, what we're going to do here, we're going to give Montez Sweat a partner in crime, and that is going to be Jared Verse from Florida State. In terms of floors from a pass rushing prospect, I, I think Jared Verse's floor is considerably high. And to be honest, I would be surprised if he has the snap count from day one, and if he, assuming he does have the snap count, that is, if he doesn't walk into six or seven sacks as a rookie. I love Verse's game. Uh, I think he his game will, tran it will translate very well to the NFL level. And uh, he was going to be a first-round pick last year, opted to go back to school, and uh, he'll be a first-round pick this year. Now, with the Raiders on the clock, this is a player I love mocking to them. It's uh, it's going to be, it's, it's a regular, if he's there, it's Talisi Fuanga. Uh, I love, love his game, and I think he fits what it means to be a true Raider. You know, I think Max Crosby fits what the Raiders' mentality is, fits the Raider mindset, and I think Fuanga will too. Uh, he's, he is an, he's a take, excuse me, he is a kick ass and take name later in the run game. And I think that's going to be the route that the Raiders are going to want to go over the next few years. And Fuanga's stock really improved over the course of the year. And there's a reason for that. There's not a lot of flaws in his game. And uh, I think he makes a tremendous amount of sense for the Las Vegas Raiders. Now with the Saints on the clock, this is a bit of a tricky pick and we're going to kind of go through the thought process here. Trevor Penning, I, well, by the way, this is all relating back to a, a pick or a, a video that I did a couple days ago on the Saints. I definitely recommend going to check that out. But tr there's a possibility that Ryan Ramchek misses the entire 2024 season. That's per Ian Rappaport. That was a tweet that was sent out, I guess, about a week ago when, when this video releases. But I was never a fan of the Trevor Penning pick. I didn't really like him as a prospect and Trevor Penning has whiffed at the NFL level. So when you factor in that, we just took what I think is a draft. I mean, I'll say dis I'll be nice and say disappointment. I think you could say bust, but I'll say disappointment because he is only entering year three. But when you factor in a disappointment in year one and two in Penning, and then you factor in that Ramchek might not play, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to draft a guy in Troy Fatanu who has both tackle and guard versatility, and a guy who he, he's just he's a great football player. And if you can take him in the first round and kind of redo or you know right the wrong mistake, if you will, from Penning for a couple years ago, while upgrading the offensive line play for a unit that desperately needs it considering how bad the Saints offensive line was at times last year. He makes a ton of sense for the Saints, and uh, it's a pick that I like a lot. The Indianapolis Colts are on the clock, and I hope you guys didn't think there was only going to be one or two trades in today's mock draft. Right now, we're, we're, we're looking to trade maybe out of conference, maybe looking to trade for a team that, that has an extra second round pick that we can trade that we can trade our third round pick. Anyway, we're looking to trade with the Eagles. Uh, they're going to give up 22 and 53, and we will send them 15 and 82. And the Eagles will come up and take corner Quinion Mitchell from Toledo. There's not a lot of explanation here needed. The Eagles need a corner. Uh, Quinion, to me, is a very, very good prospect. Uh, some people have him as the best defensive player in this class. I don't hate that take, but... Uh, Look, it fits a need, and, and now Indy has an extra second-round pick, and Howie, Howie knows he needs a corner. So, Quinion will certainly fit that bill for them. Now, with the Seahawks on the clock, aside from, you know, the, maybe the first, like, four or five picks that, that we think are going to happen, or the first, you know, we Joe Alt to the Titans, where the Titans essentially sprint that pick in when they're on the clock. This is a pick that, if he's there, it's another sprint-in scenario. And I think that Seahawks would love to get Johnny Newton. Johnny Newton, excuse me, Johnny Newton to me is the D DT1 in this class. There is so much to like about Johnny's game. And I, I really think he's not only just a good pass rushing defensive tackle, but I think he's a really good run stuffing defensive tackle too. And I was watching the Penn State Illinois game live back in September of 2023. And I just couldn't help but notice just how much Johnny impacted the game. Not only impacted, but really kind of took over. And if Illinois was a decent team this year, you know, if they had, if they had a, or an above average team rather than they had eight or nine wins and, and, you know, were 
on the you know on the cusp of, of winning the Big Ten West, I think Newton would have been talked about a lot, lot more by the national media. But with the Jags on the clock here, guys, look, I've said it a million times. They need to help out Trevor Lawrence. They need to do whatever they can to ensure Trevor Lawrence. It does I, bust is the wrong word, but. They need to do everything they can to ensure he succeeds. I don't think Gabe Davis is the answer. I don't think Jags fans think he's the answer either. They picked up Mitch Morse in free agency. I know the offensive line also needs work, but Brian Thomas Jr. is too good a talent at pick 17 to pass up. Uh, he would immediately help out the receiving game, and I don't think a 1,000 yards for him as a rookie is entirely out of the question. Now, with the Cincinnati Bengals on the clock, I would love to give them Brock Bowers. Unfortunately, he's not here. He is a New England Patriot. So what we're going to do here is we're going to mock them a position that they addressed in free agency. I know they brought in Trent Brown, but Trent Brown was only signed to a one-year deal. Trent is also above 30 years old. He should not be viewed as a guy that's going to be there for four or five years and a guy that seemingly has the position filled. So we're going to swing for the fences here on the high upside. We are going to take the big 340-pound fella in Amarius Mims and hopefully uh, protect Joe Burrow for the next several years along with that. And it's been discussed before, but I'll, I'll reiterate the point home again. If you can get a premium position at a lower cost, you, I mean, that that's a lot. That's a lot. That's what a lot of first round picks are. But especially for the Bengals here, if you can get a guy that could eventually make twenty six, twenty seven million dollars a year in Mims, why not get him for four or five million and, and pay him that for the next few years? And, you know, when you're paying Joe Burrow and Jamar the, the heavy dollar, you can at least have the discount with Mims. Now, with the Rams on the clock here. Uh, they had a pretty big player retire this year by the name of Aaron Donald. Uh, I like where they are as, as a unit. I, I like Kobe Turner. I like Byron Young. Uh, they went out in the secondary recently and brought in Tredavious White. But the rest of their defense isn't the best. Byron Murphy is a very good defensive tackle prospect. And if you can have Byron Murphy and Kobe Turner rush from the interior for the next few years, that immediately is one of the best interior duos in the NFL, period. I uh, love Byron Murphy a lot, and I the fit is phenomenal with the Rams. And I, I don't think they would pass it up in that situation. Um, with the Rams, though, they're I wouldn't put it past them to trade way up in the draft. You know, we know how reckless they can be at times with their first round picks. I wouldn't put it past them to try and go get, you know, maybe like a Roma Dunze, depending how far he falls. Unfortunately, Rome was taking a pick six for the Rams in today's mocker. Unfortunately for the Rams, but you get what I'm saying here. I, I wouldn't put it past the Rams to do something crazy, but we have them sticking and picking at 19 in today's mock, and it's Byron Murphy from the Texas Longhorns. Now, with the Pittsburgh Steelers up, uh, this is a player that I think has been overthought, and we'll get to another player that's been overthought a little bit. I, I just, well, not overthought, but I just think he's kind of underappreciated, and it's going to be Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon. Look, guys, to me, Jackson Powers Johnson, and another prospect we'll discuss later, is that he is a player that I, I don't see any way he doesn't start for at least five or six years and be a quality starter at that. And the reality of the NFL draft is not all 32 first round picks are going to be stars. And I think there's going to be several teams three or four years from now that kind of kick themselves in the rear end for saying, why didn't we take Jackson Powers Johnson when he was there? Even if it wasn't a sexy pick, why not do it? The Steelers, if we know anything about how gritty they are, they don't care about the sexy picks. They don't care about... Uh, they don't care about, you know, let's just take a receiver in the first round just to take one. They're they're a very gritty team. Love Jackson Powers Johnson. And uh, but also keep Russell Wilson upright. And, you know, Russell is not a big over the middle of the field thrower. So if you can keep pressure out of Russ's face like Jackson can, love the team, love the fit for him. Now, with the Dolphins on the clock, I think offensive line is the route they'll go. Uh, Teron Armstead is not a guy that can be counted on, at least not for 17 full games a year. He's also flirted with retirement. And to me, J.C. Latham is the best tackle prospect available. And like we've mentioned with other teams, I mean, the Dolphins have to do what they can to protect their quarterback, whether it's Tua, whether it's a guy. I mean, I don't think the Dolphins are going to trade Tua, but whether it's a guy that would be post Tua, J.C. is going to be there for the long haul and I like JC Latham's game a lot now with the Colts on the clock obviously we traded back from pick 15 we're gonna get a little bit fun here 
I would love to give them Brock Bowers. Obviously, he wasn't there when they were on the clock. So what we're going to do is we're going to give them Adonai Mitchell from Texas, who is a big, fast target. And uh, the Colts have a guy who has a pretty solid arm, some would say, in Anthony Richardson. And if you can have a receiving core of Adonai Mitchell, Josh Downs, Michael Pittman, that's a really, really good trio for a young quarterback to throw to. And the Colts' offensive line is pretty solid, of course, led by Big Q. But Bernard Ryman is also a very good left tackle. And uh, I really like how the Colts' offense would be shaping up after this. And that's not even mentioning a running back they have by the name of Jonathan Taylor. So this, to me, you get an extra two and you pick up Adnai. This would be a, a pretty dream start for the Colts' draft in 2024. The Patriots are back on the clock. We gave them Brock Bowers at pick 11. Uh, this was after they traded back from pick three. And uh, they need offensive line help. I loved loved the signing of Mike and Wainu, and I'm glad they brought him back. That was something I felt they needed to do. Not just should have, but needed to do. Now, and Wainu has guard and tackle versatility, and he's a very good offensive lineman. And we're going to draft a player that also has, you know, versatility along the offensive line. Like we said with the Patriots, the thing is they simply need to bring in better football players. They, I mean, sure, if they if they brought in a guy like, you know, if they drafted a quarterback, Bo Nix or Michael Penix, do we know they're going to work out? No, I mean, I guess you can say this with every position and kind of straw man and say, well, we don't know this, we don't know that, but they need better football players. Graham Barton and Brock Bowers would instantly improve the offense and it would, you know, instead of being 32nd in a lot of categories, hopefully we'd, you know, hopefully we'd be on the rise. Now with the Cowboys here, this board did not break well for them. And I think if this scenario played out like this, I think they'd be looking to trade back. And that's actually what we're going to do in today's video. We're going to going to trade back with the Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens are going to come up from pick 30. They're going to give up 93. Uh, they're going to, the Cowboys are going to get an extra three out of this. We're going to go ahead and force the trade on through. And the Ravens are going to draft Alabama's Terry on Arnold. Uh, I love the selection here. Um, I, I've said this a couple times. I, I want to be wrong on this, but Marlon Humphrey has played a hundred NFL games. He is entering, I want to say year eight. He was drafted back in 2017. And I think the downfall for Marlon is, is coming, whether it's in 2024, or 2025, the Ravens usually do a very good job of preparing for, uh, preparing for guys, you know, futures. And they did this last year in the third round by drafting, uh, Clemson's linebacker, Trenton Simpson, Patrick queen, of course, is now a Steeler. So they know what they're doing in terms of these things. And I think Terry would be another example of this and, uh, love the team, love the fit. The Ravens, of course, love drafting Alabama players. So I think all around it's, it's a great value and it's a great home for Terry Now with the Packers up, I, I don't think there's, I don't think there's a lot of, uh, analysis needed here look Jair Alexander Cooper DeGene Xavier McKinney that's that's a secondary that's a no-fly zone there's not going to be a lot of teams that are going to be eager to go up against that every Sunday Cooper DeGene can play anywhere he can play corner he can play safety I love the player and like we said they are they signed Xavier McKinney I know Packers fans wanted me to discuss this in, in the free agency recap I, I put it on the screen at the end, but I love the Xavier McKinney signing. I also love the Josh Jacobs signing, by the way, especially given that it was really a one-year commitment in terms of guarantees. But uh, guys, the secondary with DeGene, McKinney, and Jair, I mean, nobody's nobody's going to want to play that. And you also have to factor in that you have DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams, Justin Jefferson, and Jordan Addison, all in your division. So I'd be pretty surprised if the Packers don't go secondary in the first round if the value aligns. The Bucks are on the clock. I've mocked this pick to them a couple times in the draft process. I'm going to continue if he's there. Laiatu Latu is my favorite pass rusher in the draft. I think he has by far the deepest bag of moves. Uh, Latu makes a lot of sense for the Bucks. They released Shaq Barrett this offseason, who, of course, signed with the Dolphins. Joe Tryon-Shayenka was a first-round pick back in 2021. He has not panned out like they thought they would. And I think Latu is a better prospect than Tryon Shayinka was three years ago. It's pretty simple. Uh, Latu should not be there in pick 26. I think he's a much better prospect. Obviously, that's, you know, the medicals and everything. Medicals pending. I think Latu at his peak is a top 10 to 15 player in this class. And it's, it's great value if you can get him at pick 26. All right, Arizona Cardinals on the clock. 
they have Marvin Harrison Jr. from pick four. So what are we going to do at pick 27, especially now that we have pick 35 and 66? They have, they have a, lot of, a lot of picks here in the top 104 selections. We're going to draft a player, another guy that I think is a little bit overthought, and that's Kool-Aid McKinstry. Uh, Kool-Aid ran a sub 4-5 at his pro day, which was big for him. Uh, I like Kool-Aid's game a lot. Now, yes, Kool-Aid ran a 4-4-6-40, so he, he's not going to run with... He's not going to run with the Tyree Kills of the world. He's not going to run with the Xavier Worthies of the world, but that that's fine. I mean, if you're a defensive coordinator putting him out there against those guys one-on-one, -on -one, no safety help, that's that's a poor coaching decision, and you would be setting your own player up for failure. So I love Kool-Aid, and for the Cardinals, they're, what they need to focus on is improving the roster. And I think if you walk out of the first round with Marvin Harrison Jr. and Kool-Aid, that's a pretty good start. The Cardinals are kind of also a sleeper for me entering the 24 season. Now, with the Bills on the clock, they lost Gabe Davis in free agency. They signed Curtis Samuel from the Commanders. One player that I love mocking to them is Troy Franklin. Uh, Troy is, he's tall, he, he's, he has a lot of speed, and as we know, Buffalo's quarterback has a pretty strong arm, and if you can keep defenses honest at all times by having the sheer threat of Troy Franklin going deep, that's something I think the Bills should get behind. Also, to, that's not to say that Troy Franklin is only a deep threat guy because he's not just a deep threat guy. Uh, but look, love the fit, and Stefan Diggs is starting to decline. So if we have a quartet of Diggs, Franklin, Khalil Shakir, and I'm blanking. I said his name earlier. Curtis Samuel, there we go. If we have a quartet of those four guys, I'm leaving that in, by the way. We're all Cuban. It, it happens. Uh, if we have a quartet of those four receivers, I think that's that's really a good start in the AFC. And, you know, hopefully hopefully Diggs gets a ring before he declines too much and, you know, is not a Bill anymore. But uh, love Troy Franklin to the Bills, and I think he is a, a better – I think he would be a much better number two than what Gabe Davis was over the past few years. Now, with the Lions on the clock, we know they love to bite kneecaps, take names later. Uh, you know, if we're going to get knocked down seven, we're going to stand up eight times. We're going to draft a player that is the embodiment of that. And that is West Virginia's Zach Frazier. Frazier has a wrestling background and I am a big advocate anytime that an offensive lineman, especially an interior offensive lineman has the wrestling background. And I think you can see that in Frazier's game. Uh, they lost Jonah Jackson in free agency. Uh, this is not a player that would come in and start at center. He would not immediately uh, make Frank Ragnall sit on the bench. Frazier would presumably start at guard in this scenario. But guys, a lot of Detroit's success in 2023, obviously, you know, Jameer Gibbs and, and David Montgomery played good. Obviously, I'm not taking that away from them, but the offensive line played good too. We're not going to just take away from the offensive line and just say, all right, Jameer and David figure it out behind a lesser offensive line this year. Take a player that will, again, a plug-and-play guy and a guy that when we were discussing Jackson Powers Johnson, I think this is going to be a player that teams look at, you know, five or six years from now and effectively say, why didn't we take the good interior offensive line prospect when he fell in our laps? Detroit's not going to make that mistake, and I love the pairing, and I love especially Frazier with the, the mentality going to, Dan, going to a Dan Campbell-led team. Cowboys are on the clock. Board's still not favorable for them, but ultimately we are going to go with Tyler Guyton. Uh, I think he could play at left tackle. Uh, of course, Terrence Steele is the right tackle, but if you can keep Tyler Smith inside and have Tyler Guyton play outside, I think that's a good. I think that's, I think that's the best case scenario. Uh, there is there is some discussion about you know Tyler Smith could g kick out the left tackle and I've even mocked that before when I've mocked them Graham Barton and and effectively have said for Tyler Smith to go back out and play outside but I think you could also make a case for just keep an all pro where he is and keep a great player where he is so that's the thought process here Tyler Guyton left tackle Tyler Smith left guard and uh, we're gonna keep Terrence Steele of course on the right side now the 49ers are on the clock they need offensive line help you could force Jordan Morgan. I, I like Jordan as a prospect a lot, but I don't like him over Nate Wiggins. I do think for as good of a football player as Nate Wiggins is, with how many big receivers there are in today's NFL, like DK, like AJ Brown, you know, the bullies, if you will, the, the, the big boys, I think Nate Wiggins' stock will fall a little bit. And I think you can make a case that he's a top 15 to 20 player in this class from a sheer talent standpoint, but... I think teams are going to be scared away by by the weight. 
but if the 49ers can get him at pick 31, I love the value and he also fits a need. And I think that's a position and a player that the 49ers would love to target if, in fact, Nate is there. Now, with the Chiefs on the clock, I have one player that I absolutely love mocking to them simply because I think he makes a lot of sense. I don't think he is the 55th best player. I'm not worried about his 4 6 It is Keon Coleman of the Florida State Seminoles. Look, you have Travis Kelsey, you have Keon Coleman, you have Rasheed Rice, Marquise Brown. That's, I mean, that those four options right there are, are solid. And I think from a receiving room standpoint, you have Rasheed Rice and Marquise Brown who are the smaller targets. I think you need that big bodied guy. And uh, I don't think Keon Coleman would have a problem catching passes from Patrick Mahomes. So Keon Coleman to the Chiefs is one of my favorite fits in the latter part of the first round. Carolina Panthers fans, I would love to mock you guys Lad McConkey if he is, if, if the mock were to continue. So I know Panthers fans always love the, uh, or always want the, want the pick 33 and at pick 34 Patriots fans I think we would go Bo Nix but uh that is going to wrap up today's mock so we got a little pick 33 and pick 34 in there um but I hope you guys enjoyed and here is today's mock on the screen um but I hope you guys enjoyed and if you did please like and subscribe please comment your favorite pick your least favorite pick and uh until next time please be safe and have a great day love you guys